Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We are so pleased to have a very distinguished panel of speakers today. My name is Johanna Mendelson Foreman. I'm with the Americas Program. In behalf of myself and my co colleague, Heather Connolly of the Europe Program, we had decided to co-sponsor an event with our trustee, Henrietta Four, who is going to do most of the heavy lifting and hard work today. But I just wanted to open and welcome you. Uh, our panelists, whose names appear there and you have their biographies, will be introduced by Ms. Four. But I just wanted to tell you that on this sixth anniversary of the earthquake in Haiti, we feel this is a very appropriate moment to look back, but also more important to look forward. CSIS has had a long and abiding interest in work in the Caribbean and also working with international donors partners. So we're pleased that you were able to join us today. And I will turn the panel over to my colleague and trustee, Henrietta Four. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna, and we are very proud of your programs here at CSIS. So thank you for doing this six-month anniversary for uh, the Haiti earthquake. I just spoke uh, to the ambassador, who you do not see on the panel today. Uh, Raymond Joseph is in Haiti. He is in Port-au-Prince. He has just come from the ceremony at the palace, honoring the six months. And today was a ceremony to thank the world. And so he asked me to carry a few thoughts to you, and here they are. Uh, people say that there is no progress. And yet, uh, President Clinton today in Haiti said that in his 30 years of experience, that Haiti is ahead of where the Asian tsunami reconstruction was at this point. That um, the Haitian people, the ambassador said, have been very patient and that we are asking them to continue to be patient, that the first phase has been completed, that reconstruction starts now in the second phase, and that in approximately six weeks, we should see a lot more things happening. That's his quote. So he wants to thank the people around the world for their goodwill and for their extraordinarily generous outpouring of help to the people of Haiti. So that is from the ambassador. So let me now begin with this panel. It is the six month anniversary today, July 12th, 2010, an important date after a 7.0 Richter scale earthquake destroyed Haiti's capital Port-au-Prince and many surrounding communities. Comparable scale of this disaster is even greater than the Asian tsunami in terms of the impact on one country and it is the largest natural disaster recorded in the Western Hemisphere. You know the statistics already, 230,000 people dead, 500,000 injured, 1.5 million displaced. Moving from crisis to recovery, Haiti is nothing new for these resilient people. But only a year and a half ago, when I was administrator in USAID, and General Keene was also there, we visited Gonaive and we saw that uh, four major hurricanes had wiped out the services, that the town was underwater, 6,000 people had been killed, and people were living on their rooftops. And today, after the earthquake, Haitians are still recovering from the shock and trauma of this cataclysmic event. The city of Port-au-Prince remains a site of several thousand camps of internally displaced persons. The government is still operating out of temporary headquarters, and the country is still in a humanitarian recovery stage rather than one of rebuilding. I visited in March with Presidents Clinton and President Bush, and General Keene was also there, and what we saw was that there has been some progress, but not enough. In the last two decades, Haiti has been the scene of eight UN peace operations, the time of the earthquake, the UN's stabilization mission in Haiti, MINUSTA, was in its sixth year of operation. The mission had close to 7,000 soldiers and 2,000 police, marked an important collaboration for the region's militaries in support of Haiti's rebirth. But in spite of all of the foreign assistance that's entered Haiti over the years, and this earthquake has prompted many to proclaim that we must build back better. 
And so we have begun. The Clinton Bush Haiti Fund is focused on economic opportunity. The interim Haiti Reconstruction Commission is focusing on rebuilding infrastructure and coordinating assistance among all to match with Haiti's own development plan. Our panel today is going to assess the concept of building back better and what it means in terms of humanitarian recovery. The international philanthropic support, the role of transatlantic partners have played in this massive effort to assist Haiti and Haitians. And I think all of us are feeling a sense of urgency, that the assistance is slow, but that we are all trying to help Haitians to rebuild their own lives. So let me introduce our panel. And let me begin on my left with General Keene. Uh, General Keene is the military deputy commander of the United States Southern Command in Miami, Florida. He is the second in command of one of the 10 unified commands under the Department of Defense. He is a native of Kentucky. He was an infantry officer with 18 years in airborne status. His experience in Latin America includes assignments in Panama, Honduras, Brazil, Colombia, and as the commander of the U.S. Army South. His most recent position was the director of U.S. European Command Operations and Plan Center, thus UCOM Chief of Staff. The ambassador, unfortunately, is not with us today, uh, Raymond Joseph, but I know that all of you know his fine background as a journalist and has been our ambassador in Washington since March of 2004. Next on our panel is Sam Worthington, the President and CEO of Interaction. It is a coalition of United States-based international non-governmental organizations focused on the world's poor and most vulnerable people, with more than 180 members working in every developing country. The U.S. public contributes about $6 billion annually to its members, and the members themselves manage more than $4 billion in partnerships with the United States government. Before this, he was the National Executive Director and CEO for Plan USA, focused on child-centered community development. And he's been a good friend and good colleague of mine. Next, we have Dr. Antonio Dele Thea, Director, International Economic and Financial Affairs with the European Commission. Antonio has been Director of International Affairs at the EC's Directorate for General Economic and Financial Affairs with both authority for bilateral economic relations with non-EU countries and working with the key multilateral and regional economic <coughs> development institutions. He also acts as the European Commission's financial sous Sherpa. He has most recently been an economic advisor to Romano Prodi, the previous European Commission president, and he is an associate professor of applied economics in the Basque Country University. He is currently on secondment. We are hoping, um, Paul, I'm going to skip over you for a moment because you're going to speak first. Uh, we are hoping that later we will be joined by Julissa Reynoso, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere Affairs. She's currently at the White House. She is in the Bureau for Western Hemisphere Affairs at the Department of State. She's an attorney by trade. She has recently been with Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett in New York, focusing on international arbitration and antitrust law. She has published widely in both Spanish and English. But let me turn first to our colleague from USAID. Uh, Paul Weisenfeld is in charge of the entire U.S. government approach to reconstruction and development. He is the Haiti Task Team Coordinator. I last saw Paul when he was Mission Director in Peru. And he and Administrator Shaw were just in Haiti on Friday. So, Paul, if I may turn to you to tell us a bit about what you saw on the ground, what are the conditions, how is reconstruction coordination? Thank you. Thank you very much, Henrietta. And, and thank you to CIS for this opportunity. Um, I guess one of the first things I'd note that I saw on the ground that I think is appropriate to highlight at the six-month commemoration is we saw the results of an enormous and successful humanitarian assistance effort. It was truly an international effort led by the United Nations. The United States took a major part. The European Union took a major part. And there was a, an enormous logistical support that was absolutely critical led by our own forces that, of the United States military forces, the Department of Defense, it was led by General Keene here. 
So, and, and the results of that humanitarian assistance effort are still evident. We haven't seen a subsequent disaster related to waterborne disease in Haiti. And I think people here, as the media has talked a lot about the six-month commemoration today, you'll see the, the statistics that we see things that uh, potable water is, is 50 percent more available in Haiti today, in Port-au-Prince today, than it was before the earthquake. So I do think it's important to recognize the successful efforts and the implementing partners in this effort were the NGO community represented today by Sam Worthington. This, in terms of the ongoing effort, which everyone is rightfully focused on, we saw, had the, the good fortune of traveling with Administrator Shaw on Friday, we saw that there is a lot going on. We saw transitional housing programs. There are, are close to 5,000 transitional houses that have now been erected in and around Port-au-Prince. And we saw one of the programs that we saw that was very inspiring is an effort to repair what are called on the ground yellow houses. There's an enormous habitability assessment process that started with support from engineers of the U.S. military forces in Haiti. They're assessing the building stock that's been damaged by the hurricane. To date, 170,000 structures have been assessed. 46 percent of them have been st deemed structurally safe, and those are marked as green houses. 28 percent of them are marked as yellow houses, meaning houses that require minor repair, with about 24 percent red houses that require major repair or demolition. And one of the things that we in USAID have launched together with other international partners is an effort to repair those houses. So we've seen uh, what we saw on the ground was uh, engineers working with uh, Haitian masons, with Haitian engineers, with the Haitian ministry, and involving the communities to repair these houses and encourage people to move back in. And that's, that's a very heartening thing, because at the end of the day, what we really want to do is rebuild communities. Um, the IDP camps are a big issue that we saw. It, it is still an overwhelming issue. I think uh, Henrietta mentioned that there's still one and a half million people displaced in Port-au-Prince. And the effort going forward is, is going to have to focus in a, in a very robust and aggressive way on helping those people move into better shelter. The hurricane season is, uh, everyone knows, has, has started in Haiti. And as, uh, as I know you'll hear General Keene say, you don't need a, a, a vicious hurricane in Haiti. You just need a lot of rain in order to have a, a negative effect on people's lives and livelihoods and, and see the loss of life. So the effort moving forward has to involve moving people into transitional houses as quickly as possible, accelerating the process. The international community hopes to have 125,000 transitional shelters up by this time next year, and moving as many people as possible back into those green houses or yellow and red houses that have been repaired. Um, I think another one of the efforts we saw on the ground in meetings with uh, Prime Minister Bellarive is that the, the Haitian government has, is interested in taking a lead role in some of these key obstacles. I'll highlight two obstacles and then turn it back over to my colleagues. One is rebel removal. One of the critical impediments to getting people out of the camps and into decent housing, whether it's the green, yellow, or red houses, or whether it's new transitional housing, is removing the vast quantities of rubble. We have 25 million cubic meters of rubble in Haiti, in Port-au-Prince now. By comparison's sake, the World Trade Center in New York generated 560,000 cubic meters of Haiti, cubic meters of rubble. Again, in Haiti, it's 25 million cubic meters of rubble. It's just an enormous quantity of rubble that has to be removed. And the absence of finding clear land is, is the significant impediment to moving people out of housing. The government of Haiti, the prime minister told us while we were there, is that they are spending about $15 million over the next month of their own resources to bring in heavy equipment from the Dominican Republic to try and move, unblock the major thoroughfares, and that will free up roads for the removal of other rubble. So that's a very hopeful sign. Um, coordination is another big issue, because I think everyone knows the amount that has been pledged in Haiti is truly extraordinary. The donors pledged close to $10 billion. And it's, uh, it's easy to spend money fast. It's difficult to spend money effectively. We want to move forward quickly, but we want to make for sure we're moving forward in the right direction. And if, if you want to do that and you want to ensure that it's sustainable and effective, we need leadership from the government of Haiti. The H government of Haiti, as Henrietta mentioned, has created the Interim Haiti Reconstruction Commission, chaired, co-chaired by Prime Minister Bellarive and President Clinton. And they have already approved a number of projects going forward. And one of our efforts in the international community needs to be to support that commission with staff resources, with equipment resources, with technical expertise, 
to enable them to play a leadership role in the planning and oversight of reconstruction resources to ensure that money is spent effectively and is transparent so that the international community can have confidence that the resources are going in a way that meaningfully affects and improves people's lives. So thanks again for this opportunity. Um, Paul, I know that we will um, I know that we will come back to you with questions about uh, property titling and if that is also a problem. But let, let us turn now to General Keene. Well, th thank you very much uh, for holding this forum and uh, asking uh, South Common on behalf of uh, General Frazier. I'm very pleased to uh, represent uh, U.S. Southern Command. I would like to start uh, by uh, uh, taking us back a little bit and putting uh, some of my remarks in context. And I would refer to the photograph that's shown up here. This uh, particular photo was taken a few weeks after uh, the earthquake, and it's right outside of uh, Siti Soleil. And the banner, if you can't read it up there, that uh, uh, is uh, this soldier standing there is a Brazilian soldier. Uh, and the banner says... Uh, we guarantee the security for the reconstruction of Haiti. Uh, uh, and that was the message, uh, obviously, uh, that uh, MINUSTA and the UN forces uh, were there to do. And thankfully, they were there, because as uh, our military, the US military, and the other military uh, forces uh, that responded to the uh, earthquake, um, it was indeed fortunate that the UN forces were there on the ground. Uh, they had been there for obviously for a number of years, and the conditions that they had set with respect to security enabled us to focus our efforts on humanitarian assistance. Um, and the close collaboration uh, and coordination that we had and enjoyed with both uh, uh, the UN civilian uh, leadership, uh, and particularly obviously with uh, General Floriana Peixoto from the MINUSTA commander's role and now General Paul Cruz uh, was extraordinary. And we were able to work uh, side by side from the very first days. What's uh, out of this picture is that this is a food distribution point, one of the first 16 points that was set up to feed uh, uh, all those in need throughout Port-au-Prince. And at the food distribution point where U.S. Uh, paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne Division standing side by side as they did on many uh, places throughout Port-au-Prince with um, the U.N. Uh, military forces, in this case handing out uh, food, but in other cases uh, providing support to rubble clearing or to doing all sorts of uh, humanitarian assistance tasks. And we were able to do our task from the Joint Task Force Haiti standpoint within the envelope of security that was provided by the UN forces there throughout the course of our time there. And as you know, at the height of um, the US uh, Joint Task Force Haiti deployment, we had approximately 22,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine, and Coast Guardmen on about 1 February. Uh, we stood down Joint Task Force Haiti on 1 June, uh, but we continue with about 500 soldiers uh, from our National Guard, led by the Louisiana National Guard in Haiti uh, today, and they will be there for several more months, uh, doing a number of projects, what we call New Horizons exercises, in support uh, of uh, USAID, as well as the government of Haiti and the UN efforts, and we are particularly focused, those efforts, in areas outside Port-au-Prince, Gonaives, um, Les Cais and other areas that, while they weren't directly affected by the earthquake, they are impacted uh, from the earthquake by the displaced persons that moved to those areas, putting strains on the medical capacity in those areas as well as the schools. And we were building schools and we were providing uh, medical assistance uh, uh, programs, working uh, with the NGOs in those particular areas. Uh, so I think uh, the highlight of my time in Haiti is really captured by the close coordination and collaboration that we had working in support of our lead federal agency, USAID, but all of our interagency, but in particular with our UN forces and the NGOs. And I've often said that what I learned from this experience was that the real scouts and soldiers for humanitarian assistance are our NGOs. 
um, they were the ones that were really doing the heavy lifting. And we were able to redeploy our military forces as quickly as we did from this devastating uh, earthquake because of the capacity that they were able to respond and increase in their capacity as well as the response that the UN was able to put in place. Uh, I would like to uh, talk just a second about what we are doing now and what we uh, are looking to do as we go down uh, the road over the next uh, few months. Clearly, uh, from our perspective in terms of uh, potential impacts of weather, whether it be tropical storms or disasters, it is a major concern to us that uh, uh, what could happen in the coming weeks or months. So we have worked very closely with USAID and the UN forces in Haiti to be prepared for a storm. Uh, and again, it doesn't take an earthquake. It just takes a lot of rain in a short period of time to create a major uh, catastrophe, as we saw in 2008, to respond to that. We've done a number of things to include uh, working with uh, forces on the ground to rehearse for contingencies, making determinations and examining what's currently in place and what capacities that, that they have and what we have in place that could respond very quickly and what we think we would have to bring to bear if uh, we had something uh, along the line of what we had in 2008 or even uh, something worse than that. And we're doing a number of rehearsals, as I mentioned, both uh, in Haiti as well as U.S. Southern Command, as well as with our joint staff to talk through these contingencies and what might be needed. And I know the United Nations has also done rehearsals, rehearsals with that regard. So what I can say is everyone is focused from the tactical to the strategic level on uh, what could happen if we were to be faced with a major storm or even a lot of rain in a short period of time in Haiti in the coming weeks and months in order to allow, as the sign says uh, there, the reconstruction efforts to continue during a very, very difficult period of time. Uh, so with that, I think I'll just uh, turn it back over and take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, General Keene. Uh, well, Sam, you've had the perfect introduction for the nonprofit world, and you've just completed a survey of where all of the NGOs are in Haiti. Will you tell us a bit about the NGO response, how the money is flowing through the system, and how effective you think it's been? Well, thank you, and thank you for the comments, uh, General Keene, about the NGO community, and uh, good afternoon. Um, to understand the context of Haiti, I think it is important to step back and look at a few basic uh, common knowledges. One is the sense of scale. Um, if I think a good way for people living in Washington, D.C. is if you imagine every third or fourth building in Washington, D.C. damaged, people living out on the street, and then multiply it times three. That's the scale uh, that we're talking about. The other reality is that this was the poorest and remains the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Seventy percent of the people in Port-au-Prince were in abject poverty before the earthquake. Um, the other reality that we see, uh, and this is in the 21st century disasters, is a massive public outreach caring uh, from Europe, from North America, from this country uh, that results in a big public engagement. Uh, and uh, the last reality is that their world has created non-state actors that now play a crucial role in all global disasters. Many of these are professional institutions. Interaction represents a large number of them. Uh, we are releasing today an accountability report for 38 organizations and the work that they have done since the beginning of the disaster till now. Um, Others are institutions that have been in Haiti for decades going forward. We also have on our website a map at uh, www.interaction.org, a map of all the major operational NGOs, where they're working throughout the country, the type of projects they're doing, and the clusters in the UN clusters they're involved in. I say all this because there is a significant responsibility that rests on the shoulder of the NGO community in terms of interaction members. Our members raised $978 million to date. They've spent $294 million on reconstruction efforts. These are all brand name organizations you'll recognize from the Red Cross to Catholic Relief Services uh, to CARE to the National Rescue Committee to uh, Mercy Corps, other groups that are also present in this room. The organizations will be there for a long time, 
And because of this and because they know that resources are ultimately scarce and that public giving happens up front, uh, over $500 million has been set aside for reconstruction. And our main fear is not one that they're, we're spending too fast or too slow, but whether there will be enough resources left for the effective reconstruction of Haiti, because the burn rate uh, in these camps uh, is enormous. Um, and we do have 1.69 million, million people still in camps. Um, and as they've slowly transitioned to transitional shelter, uh, we will witness a reconstruction effort that is happening at the same time as ongoing relief, and that is not going to change anytime soon. One of the things that was significantly different from this uh, disaster than the tsunami was the degree of coordination among the different actors. Uh, from an NGO perspective, uh, it was the first time we set up an NGO coordination office 10 days after the earthquake. We had ongoing dialogue uh, with SOUTHCOM and the U.S. military, uh, working very closely within the U.N. headquarters and the cluster system with USAID. So from an operational sort of command and control coordination effort, this is the best we've seen. Uh, and yet the complexity of the disaster, uh, the magnitude of the problem, the number of actors on the ground have made it very difficult. I think it's important to recognize that all systems were stretched. While we focus oftentimes on the government of Haiti and its limitations, the NGO community in essence has reached to some extent its limit of its capacity down here. And the issue is not please spend more people down to Haiti. It's, is, are there enough highly qualified individuals who could handle a food distribution for 60,000 people for a month and have done this before, working with the military standing by, uh, able to coordinate the thousands of volunteers in a camp as you manage the camp's health infrastructure or water sanitation infrastructure. Uh, these are jobs that are acquired over time, and the professional global NGO community in many ways has remained as stretched as it can, and we've seen some of our members move from 80 people on the ground before the earthquake to over 1,000 at this point in time, and I'm just talking about one interaction member. Um, the Interim Commission on the Reconstruction of Haiti is a very positive step. I think our challenge is that uh, it, uh, while it has been stood up, its uh, capacity to coordinate still remains limited. Um, we need uh, greater resources invested into that capacity. The NGO community stands ready to put resources into the government of Haiti. Our space tends to be at the district and municipal level. In many ways, we are uh, confronting a, a challenge by what has not happened. As Paul mentioned, um, it's the disease outbreaks that have not occurred. It's the access to clean water uh, that is in place. Uh, it's shelter uh, and so forth that exists in camps. And in many ways, this is, could be one of the distortions of aid. Uh, for some individuals, you've created conditions in the camps that were better than the slums they lived in beforehand. Um, this has led to some extent to individuals coming within the camps, and yet as the humanitarian community, it is our imperative to try to make life uh, as easy as possible to individuals in very difficult circumstances. Uh, the next uh, significant step is a very complex one. The world has uh, significant difficulty dealing with an urban disaster. Urban disasters cannot be handled simply in different uh, silos of activity, but there need to be some broad strategic planning. And while um, we do have this uh, uh, Presidential Commission on Resettlement, and it's beginning to look at the ways to move individuals, we still have a circumstance where individuals remain afraid to go back to their homes. At last estimate, there are 45,000 homes that were labeled green with individuals who had not yet migrated back to their homes. Um, to some extent, this is understandable given the shock of the earthquake. Um, but this shows that it is not just about reconstructing buildings, but it's about rebuilding lives. It's enabling individuals to have a sense of economic well-being in places where they may be resettled, to have a sense that the roof over their head may be one uh, that is secure and safe, that they can have a livelihood. And this is where it is crucial to talk about the rebuilding of Haiti and not just the rebuilding of the Port-au-Prince and other uh, Leogan affected earthquake areas, but rather an investment in jobs and a capacity of a country to lift itself. If you look at our map and see where the N U.S. NGO community is working, it is all over the country. 
and it is crucial that relief efforts and the reconstruction efforts look at Haiti as a whole and invest ultimately in the Haitian people. And I think when we are talking about, to some extent, the NGO community being the front line of this disaster, the real front line are the Haitian people. Uh, the work being done in the camps is being done by the Haitian people. Uh, over 90% of all NGO staff are from Haiti. Um, and it's ultimately the Haitian people who are moving that piece of rubble one person at a time in a cash for work program. And so I'll give you hopefully a general sense of our community, its work, and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. And I know we'll want to come back to your comment about running out of money, the pull of the long term and the short term. Antonio, let us turn to you for your thoughts from Europe. I know that you have focused on sanitation, on shelter, on transitional shelter, but you've also been thinking about the long term. So where are your priorities? Yes, well, thank you very, very much for having invited uh, the EU delegation and myself in particular. Uh, let me uh, add to, to the nice word of introduction that uh, uh, since a few months uh, I'm uh, Minister for Economic Affairs at the EU delegation here. So this uh, explains why. <laughs> I participate in this, uh, in this forum. So coming back to, to the main subject, uh, indeed uh, the, uh, the approach that the, uh, uh, the European Union has taken in this, uh, in this uh, catastrophe uh, has, has been based on, on a quick assessment of the situation, which in fact, as uh, other speakers have, uh, have highlighted, uh, it has been a, a major humanitarian, humanitarian disaster, so a humanitarian uh, com uh, component was key. It is more important that, than the Asian uh, tsunami, so that's the first point. But the second and as crucial point that it was not uh, the case in many other uh, catastrophes is that uh, in, this, in this one, uh, there was almost a complete dis disruption of the country and the state. So the uh, uh, the key institutions of the Haitian state uh, were struck, were destroyed, uh, uh, besides the human and physical losses of the, uh, of the governance of the country. The president's palace, the key ministries, parliament, judiciary uh, were affected, uh, which of course uh, made more difficult to respond in a, in a coordinated and, and in an effective way uh, to the, uh, uh, to, to the uh, huge challenges that were, they were facing. A third element that uh, is uh, important when looking back to it is that uh, uh, the, uh, the country was already in a very fragile situation. So it was not a, a normal country. It was a country with plenty of weaknesses. And, uh, and uh, these made it even more difficult uh, to respond. Uh, fourthly, uh, the international community, not, not only the, uh, the government uh, and, and the state was affected, but the international community that was working on the ground was also very much touched by the, by the uh, uh, earthquake. Uh, in, in our case, uh, I mean, the uh, head of uh, our delegation had to be uh, evacuated. Our charge d'affaires was killed in the, in the earthquake. And as, as, as many others, uh, many, many other uh, delegations or many other uh, representatives of the international community uh, were in, in a in situation of distress or even incapacity to, to react. And uh, I mean, all this led to, to a certain inability uh, to, uh, uh, to respond as everyone would have liked uh, to the gravity of the situation. So in this context, what was the EU uh, response? I mean, uh, again, it was uh, geared to the, to the main problems. The first one, as I said, it was a humanitarian and, and civil protection problem. The second one was reconstruction. A reconstruction, both a physical and reconstruction of the state, or at least support to the state, to the, to, to the continued governance of the state. So in the first uh, aspect, humanitarian aid, well, I, I, won't, I will not enter in a beauty contest, but just a, a very few uh, figures. Uh, almost 4 million US dollars were released in, in 24 hours. Uh, 800 experts, uh, 2,000 military personnel, two, 260 gendarmerie officers uh, were uh, posted to the, uh, on the ground. And they, of course, they, they didn't come by themselves. They, they brought with them uh, I mean, uh, uh, assets, uh, ur urban search and rescue teams, uh, advanced medical posts, water purification modules that were, uh, were absolutely necessary to face the immediate uh, needs. But uh, 
as you rightly said, uh, besides this uh, short-term uh, humanitarian and civil, civil protection uh, element, we were also looking at the reconstruction of the state. Reconstruction, uh, as I said, uh, both in terms of uh, physical assets, uh, but also in terms of uh, uh, enabling the state uh, to, uh, to, 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 um, to pursue its activities. And, uh, and this is a point that uh, I would like to make. We were always under the principle that uh, reconstruction cannot be done in, on behalf of the Asian state. Reconstruction must be run by the Haitian state. And this was a, a, a very important uh, element that uh, uh, indeed, uh, I mean, in the short term, in the short term uh, there could be a price to be paid for that, but in the longer term was, in our opinion, uh, crucial because we know that uh, after a while the, uh, the attention of the, of the media will fade away and uh, it is of not much use to leave the country uh, to a government that is not capable of running the, uh, uh, I mean, the day-to-day uh, uh, -day affairs. So we, from from the beginning, we uh, we put a lot of emphasis on helping the government uh, to, I mean, to, to to restore its basic activities, and uh, and being in the, in the back in the back seat uh, together with uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, the, all the military and the other uh, international community donors. So, and then, uh, as for reconstruction in accordance with the uh, government of Haiti. Uh, we we um, based our action on three three main priorities. One was governance. Uh, second was road infrastructure, uh, in order to enable uh, the, the reintegration of the country and the uh, and the delivery of of the aid. It was crucial uh, to, to to restore the uh, uh, the infrastructure. And third, uh, to, uh, uh, to to rebuild or to maintain the social services. So. In, uh, as I said, uh, much of the aid was, uh, was geared toward uh, uh, just helping the state to, to go on. So the, much of the aid, uh, or a big part of the aid was channeled through budget support just to, to let the, the country uh, go, go on. I mean, to let the government uh, keep on paying bills and, and, and service and provide the, the basic services. Uh, there was, of, of course, emergency aid. There was, of, of course, uh, help to reconstruct uh, physically the, the ministries and the and the, uh, the uh, post of command. And then uh, a, a point I would like to uh, also to, to emphasize is that uh, uh, to some extent this capacity of the government to, uh, to uh, respond to the uh, society's needs has been uh, slightly hampered by the, uh, by the political, uh, political situation and the fact that uh, there are elections uh, um, scheduled for, for uh, the month of November. So again, we believe that uh, it is important that Haiti uh, re recovers its own uh, normal uh, uh, political activity and democratic activity, and therefore it is what part of our aid is also geared towards supporting the electoral process, both financially but also uh, technically. And of course, in helping the state to, to restore and to, and to recover and to, co to continue delivering, uh, we have provided significant uh, technical assistance through our teams and through uh, NGOs. So the, finally, the point of aid coordination. Indeed, uh, as, as we, we all mentioned, it was an unprecedented challenge that uh, uh, the various uh, components of the international community were facing. And it, it was a high responsibility because the, the generosity of both bilateral aid, uh, official aid, but also the, the, the private aid uh, in an unprecedented way can, could not be just uh, disappointed. Uh, we know that uh, it is our responsibility to make sure that people see that, uh, that this is useful and therefore that uh, th this example uh, can also be useful for the future. So uh, we face uh, uh, important uh, problems. Uh, in, uh, on our side, it was, uh, it, it was also somewhat unprecedented the, the, the uh, need to coordinate uh, the military and the civil uh, parts of, of uh, both uh, humanitarian aid but also recovery. Uh, of course, when we look backwards, the, the bottle is half empty and half full, but uh, as, uh, as others have said, what, I mean, the, the half full is significant and uh, cannot, uh, c cannot uh, uh, despair us from the fact that indeed there is still a lot of uh, suffering and there, and there is still a lot to be done. So uh, I think I will stay there. Uh, we have ourselves learned uh, a few lessons. We have 
put in place and, and started uh, improved cooperation uh, methods within uh, the EU for co uh, coordinating the, uh, the assistance that is run by the European Commission uh, through, uh, from the European Union budget with that that comes from our member states. So we have uh, initiated new programming, joint programming uh, efforts, but uh, I mean, and, and also we, we have initiated new methods of coordinating uh, with other, other donors. So all that uh, has, has uh, uh, have been lessons that we have learned and that we, we hope that we will be useful both for the second stage of the uh, of reconstruction of AC, but, uh, of AT, but also for uh, other cases uh, that may appear in the in the in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Um, let me ask our panel a couple of quick questions on what they think lies ahead, so that we all have a shared sense of what the people on the ground can be expecting, as well as those of us in the development community. Uh, so, panelists. Um, in the area of housing, what can people look forward to? Um, we have a number of issues on property rights, on rubble removal, on transitional housing, but there is a, a great number of people, as Sam mentioned, that are still in tent camps. So what do you see ahead? Paul, fine. Well, I think what we see ahead is the need for a major planning effort. I think at one level is there's Port of Prince and then there are areas outside of Port of Prince because we had somewhere between 400 and 600,000 people migrated outside of Port of Prince. They present different challenges. But to start with Port of Prince, for instance, I think what we as the international community need to do is help the government develop a master plan. They need to have a vision of what they want Port of Prince to look like. Where do they see the residential neighborhoods? There are some camps that are in areas that are potentially viable as areas for new settlements, and there are others that are, that are not because of the terrain. So there need to be those kinds of master planning decisions made. There are, another, uh, there are some other key issues that have to be walked through. One of them we, I, I mentioned, others have mentioned, is rubble removal there. We really need to help them accelerate rubble removal in a robust way, and there needs to be planning to do that, which includes things such as an increased number of uh, disposal sites. There's one major disposal site, and that's a significant impediment. The roads that are being used for normal traffic are being used for rubble removal, and we need to help them plan out increased numbers of roads, increased numbers of rubble sites, crushers, a network of crushers around the city, so that you can reduce the amount of rubble that has to physically be moved. The land tenure you mentioned is a very, very complicated issue. I've heard the Prime Minister say that they had a pilot land tenure program in San Mark years ago. And they asked people to come forward and, and, and put forward their claims for land. And the people in that one city, the numbers of claims that came in that one city exceeded the entire land mass of the country of Haiti. So working through those difficult property issues is really going to be a morass and we need to set up, kind of in, from our perspective, a community-based way to allow people to register their claims and allow them to be adjudicated at a community level where people know who lives where, who owns what. Um, another complicating factor is beneficiary selection. Seventy percent of the population of Port-au-Prince more or less were renters. So who, and many of them lived in multiple family dwellings. The model being pursued by a lot of us, a lot of NGOs, are these transitional house shelters, which are things that are easy to put up in the, in the, to deal with the humanitarian imperative of getting people in more functional shelter as we worry about the rains. But if you had a plot of land that had a multifamily dwelling and five families living in several stories, and several of them were renters and some were owners, and you put up one transitional shelter, who gets it? So, there, there's, there, there is a long list of things that have to be worked through. At the same time, I think we will see in the coming months, as I mentioned, we have 5,000 transitional shelters that have been put up. We have uh, thousands and thousands of houses that have been assessed as habitable. So we're, we're going to start to see movement in the, in the coming months. But we need to, in order to see, to really deal with the 1.6 million displaced people, we have to work through that complicated morass of issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. Um, Antonio, you mentioned the elections. Will they help or hurt this situation on housing? Well, I understand that uh, land, uh, uh, land rights, uh, in, to some extent, have also been uh, I mean, the, the solution, the settlement of, of these rights, uh, has been also uh, hindered by, by uh, the uh, pre-electoral phase uh, towards the, uh, both the presidential and, uh, and the legislative uh, 
the process. So uh, going through that uh, may clarify the situation and, and may enable the government and, and, the, uh, uh, and, the, uh, and Parliament to focus on that and, and then clear the way for uh, the solution or at least an betterment of the situation there. Mm -hmm. And Sam, would you also weave in your thoughts about the health, the sanitation systems, and school? Because we're coming up to the new school year. Well, President Praval had as his top priority uh, getting people back to school. And there are, uh, in a lot of the camps now, uh, child-friendly spaces and school spaces for children to begin uh, school, uh, to some extent, associated with the camps. I think it was somewhere slightly more than 3,000 schools were destroyed. Uh, many of these are... Unfortunately, buildings where you look uh, and there's a floor and then two feet above that floor, there's another floor. Um, and you unfortunately know that uh, there may still be a lot of uh, uh, bodies uh, in that school. Uh, it will take a long time before we could begin to uh, rebuild schools over, over time. And this gets back to the question of rubble removal. It also has to do with the, uh, the dealing with issues of human remains, um, uh, the whole uh, sense of how can a community uh, feel that this is a safe space for their children to go to, especially those that have lost children and so forth. Uh, sanitation uh, and health overall, uh, the big challenge is can we uh, have the conditions to some extent that have been achieved in many of the camps become a reality for the rest of the city? Um, and that will not happen overnight. It ultimately means, uh, in terms of health, uh, the building of a Ministry of Health infrastructure uh, from the top down, but also from the bottom up. Uh, the NGO community is uh, less good at working with directly at the top of a ministry and building its capacity, and we leave that to nation states. But when it comes to frontline clinics and delivery systems of those frontline clinics, uh, cold chains for vaccines and so forth, down to those clinics, uh, that is an expertise that the NGO community is currently working with the government hate of Haiti, uh, with the Ministry of Health to uh, help develop that infrastructure over time. In terms of land, I think it's important to give a sense of just how crowded some of these camps are. There are camps on median strips of roads. Uh, there are camps on very steep hills. Uh, people are uh, living, uh, you know, I've witnessed two sort of uh, football soccer fields uh, with about 5,000 people uh, living on them. Uh, space is at a premium. Um, and this whole issue of how to find appropriate land, and yes, there has been some resettlement of sites outside the city, uh, but as Paul indicated, this will be a slow, complex process of working out uh, land rights, as it was in Aceh in Indonesia. Um, and it is not simply, you can't simply go out there and rapidly build if you haven't worked out with individuals in a community what to do. And lastly, um, beyond all the planning that any of us will do, uh, I think we have to acknowledge the ingenuity of the Haitian people, of the individuals who will go back to their own plot to set up something. And some of the, the core logic behind transitional shelter is to give individuals something to work with to rebuild a home, recognizing that a fully reconstructed home will take time and that it will require extensive, uh, some extensive urban planning, which is uh, yet to occur. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and General Keene, uh, you had brought in the USS Comfort precisely for the fact that there were not enough facilities in country. Uh, what now happens? Do you feel that there is enough capacity in country to pick up where you leave off? You have been an enormous help, but all of us are a little worried with you leaving. General Keene. Well, in, uh, in this particular uh, case, the uh, devastation of the uh, earthquake was so significant uh, that the overwhelming uh, response from uh, the international community and, uh, and, of course, the robust deployment of U.S. military there in all the areas, particularly in the uh, medical area, we weren't quite sure what was needed in terms of how much was needed. And, and therefore, we responded uh, with uh, uh, a hospital ship uh, in order to address what we knew was going to be a, a great demand. But what uh, I think uh, many of us were surprised at, uh, in the particular medical 
uh, arena was how quickly the NGO community was able to respond and, and, and rebuild capacity, even in a rudimentary way, to address the uh, uh, devastation. And then from the military perspective, how we enabled that was by opening the airport and the seaport as quickly as possible to enable uh, these deployments of um, NGOs, whether it be hospital capabilities, uh, from governments. Uh, but I think uh, uh, we weren't quite sure how quickly we would be able to transition in terms of uh, decreasing the size of our military based upon the increasing capability of, of uh, the international community, whether it be NGOs or uh, other militaries. Um, in some areas, we were surprised just how quickly they were able to be medical being one of them. Uh, I know I personally was surprised at how quickly that capacity was able to build. But just getting around the city in terms of transportation was a huge, huge problem, not because, uh, only because of the uh, uh, devastation and the uh, uh, numbers of roads that were blocked through to rubble and uh, everything else, but just to the lack of uh, uh, transportation assets and getting those in there. So um, I, I think uh, what we can be, um, uh, on the positive side to see was in, in many areas the, the uh, buildup of capacity, but the long-term reconstruction efforts in order to sustain that capacity, I think, is the, uh, is the question. And the major area that we were faced with and a lesson that we took away with it was the, the numbers of displaced persons and how we were uh, having to deal with that and the lingering effects of that, as, we've, as we talked about, I think, uh, is the capacity that still uh, is not reached to the level, but it was something that our military, of course, uh, does not, uh, was not there to uh, provide shelter, uh, but we were able to uh, support uh, the efforts of the NGO community where, where appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, one quick question before I turn to our just arrived panelist, Julissa Reynoso. Um, panelists who've just spoken, meeting Paul and Antonio and Sam and General Keene, uh, are we ready for the hurricane season? No, uh, hold for just one moment. Okay, panelists, are you ready for the, uh, for the hurricane season? Are we ready? Well, at a fundamental level, it's, I think one can never say you're ready for a hurricane season. So I think we have to admit that there's an enormous amount of work that's been done. Um, there's been major prepositioning of medical supplies of various commodities, food and blankets. Just on the USAID side alone, we have thousands and thousands of kits, kits for 100,000 people pre-positioned either in Port-au-Prince or in a warehouse in Miami that we maintain. The American Red Cross, the European Union, UN agencies have pre-positioned large amounts of food, blankets, non-food items, medical supplies. Um, so I think people are prepared. I think in, in discussions in Haiti on Friday, I think we saw that there needs to be a little better effort at coordination because all of these different groups are doing all kinds of wonderful work. And I think some, uh, some conversations need, still need to take place to understand everything that's been done and understand what, the, what potential gaps are. There may be no gaps, there may be some gaps, but I think we can do a little bit of a better job doing that and identifying where we need to fill the gaps. At the end of the day, um, if a major hurricane hits, it's going to, it's going, it's not going to be pretty. But I think we are ready to respond quickly. The, I know General Keene can certainly speak to the, the great work that the U.S. military has done to prepare to respond in the event of a major hurricane. General Keene. Well, since last November, uh, the U.S. Southcom has had to respond to four different uh, disasters in Latin America, this only being one of them. So I think uh, it's not a matter of, uh, uh, if it's only a matter of when we have to respond during this hurricane season. Hopefully it won't be uh, back to Haiti. Uh, but I think the message I would say is the international community uh, and all of our partners uh, in the region certainly need to be prepared uh, because uh, Haiti is very vulnerable uh, to uh, not just a hurricane but uh, just a heavy rainfall, if you will. And I think uh, that is something that everyone has taken extremely seriously, both on the ground as well as uh, those of us in U.S. Sir, uh, Southcom in terms of uh, we watch the weather very closely and, uh, and, and we uh, do things to prepare for uh, if we do have to return and how we would do it in working with uh, those that are uh, on the ground but uh, also the international community. Thank you. Hulissa, well, Madam Secretary, it's wonderful to have you here. Welcome. Um, we are interested in your thoughts on how we are doing 
You've been gathering the Latin American community and the Caribbean community to be helpful, so your thoughts? Yeah, and I, I apologize for being late. I have President Fernandez in town um, today uh, from the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the most remarkable uh, piece of the story is the, the, the response from the international community to the, to the disaster. Uh, from, 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 the, from day one, um, we had, at one point, 140 nations uh, respond uh, uh, to, the, to the disaster uh, in some capacity or another. And, and currently, in every country in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, did something for Haiti, which is, uh, if you know the history of Haiti and its relationship with its neighbors is, is, is truly amazing, uh, being the fact that Haiti was isolated for so many years and, uh, because of the, the way it became a nation and, uh, and, and for a period of time because it was simply the poorest country in the, in the, in, because it is the, the, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, many of its neighbors did not want much to do with it. Now, uh, essentially starting with the MINUSTA, um, Brazil being the lead in MINUSTA and the uh, diversity and the contributions of many countries to MINUSTA, especially uh, countries from, from South America, Uruguay, Paraguay, Chile, Brazil, Argentina. It's, it started with that, and now we have uh, contributions and, and, uh, and, and presence of, of, of the entire region in, uh, in Haiti, from, from Canada down to Chile. And, and CARICOM, uh, uh, the community of the Caribbean, is also playing a significant role uh, in, in Haiti today, primarily through um, its, its political um, leverage. Uh, and it, it will uh, also play a, a role, we believe, in the upcoming elections, being uh, a major uh, uh, factor in terms as observers and also as, as one uh, that can, uh, as, an, as an organization in a, in a community that, can, that has the, uh, the, the political standing to, to be, uh, to be a, a, an honest broker. Uh, obviously, the Dominican Republic um, is critical uh, as well, given its 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 proximity and the fact that uh, that uh, many of the at least the initial assistance uh, for Haiti came through the Dominican Republic through the Dominican roads and the airports, and it has continued to be a, a, a sound neighbor and and partner uh, uh, with Haiti, uh, and we hope and, and and believe it will continue to play that role. Um, the biggest challenge going forward is keeping that level of commitment from from the world. Um, and making sure that the pledges uh, that were made in March and the, uh, not only obviously the monetary, but also the, the, the commitment, the political, uh, economic, and, and moral support that Haiti deserves from its neighbors and from the whole world is, is, is sustained. The, the, the region in particular play is, is significant in, in that, to, uh, in, to that effect. And, and our job in the State Department partly is to make sure that we keep our neighbors invested in Haiti, uh, from MINUSTA to uh, reconstruction to uh, political support to uh, inst instability. And that will take all of us, um, uh, from the richest to the poorest. So uh, that's kind of where we are. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's something that we've never seen before in terms of the, the role, the, the input, and the uh, participation <laughs> by the by the Western Hemisphere in one country, uh, and, and it's so far been for the good, um, and we hope it will continue that way.